Hello, my name is Stephen McNeil. I am a PhD student in art history at Queen's University. Today, I am presenting a paper entitled Governor John Wentworth and the Vice Regal Interior in British North America. My interest in this topic stems from the research I am currently carrying out for my PhD. My thesis explores the residences that were built for the governors of Canada's maritime provinces during the early 19th century as sites of patronage and consumption. This includes one house that was built under the direction of John Wentworth at Halifax, Nova Scotia. I am interested in the design and construction of these houses, as well as the objects, particularly the paintings, silver and furnishings that were commissioned for them. John Wentworth was the last royal governor of New Hampshire in the years leading up to the American Revolution, and he later went on to be Lieutenant Governor of Nova Scotia. In both places, he had extraordinary houses built to serve as his official residence as governor. This is a watercolor painting of Wentworth's secondary country house in Nova Scotia, known as the Prince's Lodge, just outside of Halifax on the shores of the Bedford Basin. It was painted by a visitor to the house, George Harriet, in 1802. While governor of New Hampshire, John Wentworth occupied a handsome townhouse in Portsmouth that still stands today. He also built an extraordinary country house at Wolfboro, New Hampshire, called Wentworth House, that was more than three times the size of his townhouse and was, at the time, one of the largest and most opulent houses in New England. Regrettably, Wentworth House did not survive long. It and all of its contents were confiscated during the American Revolution. After passing through multiple owners during the late 18th and early 19th centuries, the house tragically caught fire and burned in 1820. I say tragically because although we know Wentworth House was among the largest and grandest houses in New England in the 1760s and 70s, we have no clear record of what it looked like. There are no known images or drawings of the house and no surviving architectural plans. However, the house is described in several letters written by the Wentworths and by some of their friends who visited and detailed inventories of its contents were made in the 1770s and 1780s that have been carefully preserved in the New Hampshire State Archives and are a testament of the scale of the estate. Several objects, including some furniture, silver, and porcelain, have survived that seem very likely to have been made for and used within the house. Last summer, with the support of a research grant from the Decorative Arts Trust, I was able to spend time in New Hampshire to see and learn as much as I could about this amazing house. The buildings and objects Wentworth commissioned and owned in New Hampshire were important and fascinating to study, first and foremost because they were extremely ambitious and sophisticated for their time and place. But they were also hugely important precedents for the buildings and objects Wentworth commissioned later in Nova Scotia. Although much has been written about Wentworth, both in New Hampshire and in Nova Scotia, very little has been done to connect the two worlds. This is what I will focus my presentation on today. My aim is to demonstrate that Wentworth's architectural and material patronage in Nova Scotia was shaped and determined by his earlier patronage in New Hampshire. In both cases, he went on ambitious building sprees, fueled by the desire to build spaces that would be powerful symbols, symbols of the authority of a royal governor and of a rigid social hierarchy. I felt an odd sense of drama visiting places and touching objects that John Wentworth had abruptly abandoned in the 1770s and never returned to. After becoming familiar with the places he lived in Nova Scotia during the early 1800s, it was a revelation for me to see the world he left behind before building the one I knew so well. Even to this day, the archivists, curators, and collectors I met with, both in New Hampshire and Nova Scotia, knew their own objects inside and out but were somewhat unfamiliar with those associated with Wentworth on the other side of the border. In both places, Wentworth left behind separate legacies and myths. Indeed, he was chased out of New Hampshire, but went on to build and shape an important part of Halifax.
Wentworth was a man of exacting standards and expensive taste. He commissioned works from the best known artists of his day. This is a portrait by Copley. Dated 1769, it was painted while the building of Wentworth House was well underway. The suit Wentworth wears is likely one he had made in London shortly before departing for North America to take up his post as governor of New Hampshire. I'm happy to say I've uncovered what I believe is the original receipt for the suit in the collection of the Massachusetts Historical Society. The receipt shows Wentworth ordered a court suit of grey silk with white silk stockings and embroidered trim from a London tailor in November 1766, just before departing for New Hampshire to take up the position of governor. Wentworth House appears to have been one of the largest and grandest private residences in 18th century New England. Wentworth's own statements, inventories of the contents of the house and outbuildings, maps, and the evidence of the site itself all testify to the grand scale of the house and its grounds, and to Wentworth's still greater vision of what the estate would have become when completed. Although no architectural plans for the house have survived, Wentworth's letters show it included a 40-foot room that was used for entertaining and possibly even intended for use as an alternate meeting place for the Legislative Assembly during the summer months. Political events denied the fulfillment of Wentworth's vision as work on the house was still ongoing when he was forced to abandon it. Had things turned out differently and had Wentworth been able to finish Wentworth House, it seems likely it would have been a unique New England equivalent to the great plantations of Maryland and Virginia. In Portsmouth, John Wentworth lived in a handsome townhouse that still exists to this day. This townhouse was owned by Wentworth's brother-in-law, John Fisher. Wentworth rented the townhouse while concentrating his efforts on his great country house at Wolfboro. Although it was, and still is, a substantial, handsome house, Wentworth felt it was far too modest. He described it as a small hut when writing to his friends in England and complained that it was completely inadequate for he and his wife to entertain in. Despite this, he did make efforts to improve the house, including ordering and installing what was then extremely costly damask wall coverings. Amazingly, these wall coverings still exist to this day. The photo on the right shows a detail of them. Although faded, they give a wonderful sense of the richness that Wentworth demanded when setting up his home. Despite these improvements, Wentworth never made an effort to build his own house in Portsmouth, and instead focused his efforts on his ambitious country house at Wolfboro. Where did Wentworth get such grand ambitions for his residences in North America? The first and most obvious answer comes from the time he spent in England. For several years leading up to his appointment as governor of New Hampshire, Wentworth lived in London, representing the interests of New Hampshire and the Wentworth family in England, which incidentally he saw as one and the same. While there, he became a close friend of the Marquess of Rockingham, Charles Watson Wentworth, who served twice as Prime Minister. Apparently, the two men met while betting on horses and came to assume, because of their shared last name, that they were cousins. If they were cousins, it has yet to be clearly proven, and they would have been very distant ones at that but John Wentworth was happy to run with this idea. He was a frequent house guest at the Marquess's great country house in Yorkshire, Wentworth Woodhouse, seen here in a watercolor by Paul Sandby. Wentworth Woodhouse was, and indeed still is, the largest privately owned house in England. At the time that John Wentworth stayed there, the interiors of the house were being finished and the Marquess was actively acquiring extraordinary furniture and works of art for the house. John Wentworth was overwhelmed by his experience at Wentworth, Wentworth Woodhouse and set out to recreate what he could of it on a much more modest scale in New Hampshire. Indeed, he wrote to his English friends, telling them he hoped his house in New Hampshire would be a Lilliputian Wentworth house. Wentworth House was meant to be symbolic in a number of ways. Partly of the expanding importance Wentworth intended New Hampshire to take on within the growing colonies. The British had just recently captured Quebec from the French with the great victory of General Wolfe on the Plains of Abraham. This meant England finally had control of Eastern North America, however briefly that may have been, and Wentworth had great plans to ensure New Hampshire's place in this newly expanded territory. 
He planned to construct a major roadway connecting Quebec City and Boston that would run directly through the New Hampshire and pass through Wolfboro. This did not happen, but it is evidence of the wildly ambitious planning that Wentworth had in mind for New Hampshire as a key part of what he hoped would be an expanding British North America. The image on the left shows a detail of a map by Henry Holland in the Beverly Historical Society showing the placement of Wentworth House and its prominence as a local landmark. The image on the right is an 18th century sign for the General Wolfe Tavern, which would have been the halfway point between Portsmouth and Wentworth House and a regular stopping place for the Wentworths and their guests. This sign is now in the collection of the New Hampshire Historical Society. All that remains of Wentworth House today is a partly reconstructed foundation where the house once stood, shown here on the left. Despite this, early maps and John Wentworth's own writings give a good sense of the magnitude of the estate. His laborers are estimated to have been as high as 150 men during the first two years. These men cleared several hundred acres of land, created two apple orchards, as well as a 600 acre deer park. While only the foundations remain, Systematic excavations at the site during the 1980s have attempted to understand the layout of the estate and the exact materials that were used there. The magnificent porcelain plate on the right is from a set that would have been used by the Wentworths at Wentworth House. The plate shown here is in the collection of the New Hampshire Historical Society. Several pieces of the service exist in collections in and around Portsmouth and have long been associated with Wentworth House by oral tradition. Thankfully, the archaeological digs that took place here in the 1980s have confirmed that pieces from this set were indeed in use at Wentworth House, and they certainly date from the governor's lifetime, amplifying the case that they were likely used by the Wentworths and not later occupants. One of the grandest and most fascinating rooms within Wentworth House was the East India Room. Its very existence is a sign of Wentworth's station as a powerful colonial governor, very much aware of and engaged in overseas trade. The whereabouts of the contents of this room are unknown today, but some idea of their possible grandeur can be found in an amazing suite of Chinoiserie furniture with Wentworth family associations, seen here in a photo of the Moffat Ladd House in Portsmouth. Several pieces are in the Moffat Ladd House, and one of the highlights of my summer research trip was viewing this furniture up close and in person. This suite of furniture was for many years thought to have been made for and used by John Wentworth, either at his house in Portsmouth or at his country house at Wolfboro. However, recent research and consideration of inventories of the homes of John Wentworth and his immediate family indicate that this suite may have been owned and used by John Wentworth's sister and her husband, John Fisher. Whether it was in John Wentworth's own house or that of his sister, this suite of furniture certainly is a testament to the extraordinary objects this family surrounded themselves with. Two chairs from this suite are now in the collection of Colonial Williamsburg. This image shows one of the chairs at Williamsburg. From the photograph, you can see the outstanding carving. It is worth noting the chairs do bear some resemblance to Chippendale's published drawings, but they are by no means a copy of any specific Chippendale design. Instead, they are inventive and made up of a pastiche of details and proportions that relate closely to Chippendale. Moving on, I'd like now to look at the house that Wentworth had built in Nova Scotia. The two watercolors seen here show the east and west facades of Government House in Halifax. For the first time, Wentworth was successful in obtaining approval from the Legislative Assembly to pay for the cost of constructing the house. He had previously attempted and failed at this in New Hampshire. Instead there, his great construction projects were funded by his father, who was a wealthy merchant and landowner. The members of the Nova Scotia Legislative Assembly, most of them representing rural areas, 
initially voted 10,500 pounds for the governor's residence. Over time, the cost for the governor's house swelled beyond three times the original estimate. This, of course, caused great strain between Wentworth and some members of the assembly and greatly eroded his effectiveness as a governor in the minds of many. I believe Wentworth was successful in having the assembly back his extraordinary building scheme, partly because the members valued the house as a symbol of the success and prosperity of their colony. You could say they were in some ways trying to overcome the reputation of the province as a place of limited means for growth. Indeed, among many, it had earned the dubious title of Nova Scarcity. If this was Wentworth's aim, he was successful. His successor as governor, George Prevost, immediately requested an increase in his salary after visiting the house. He naturally assumed that a colony governed from such a grand residence should compensate him accordingly. This floor plan shows the house was built for entertaining on a grand scale and intended to be used as a hybrid space, part private home for the governor and his family, and part public space for grand entertainment, diplomacy, and governing the colony. The room Wentworth was most adamant about was the ballroom. Just as he had been in New Hampshire, in Nova Scotia, he was very concerned that he have a room large enough to entertain in, as well as to call meetings of his executive council. Indeed, during Wentworth's time, this house was in a way the seat of government. The executive council had to meet in rented rooms or meet in the comfort of Wentworth's great house. I've brought this image to give you an idea of the interior of one of the reception rooms at Government House in Halifax, as it still is today. The interior work is quite plain and restrained in design and proportion. The wallpaper can be seen as a holdover from Wentworth's fascination with chinoiserie, although the paper you see here today was installed much after Wentworth's death. This is a detail of the ballroom with its plaster decorations and classical columns. Shipping records show that significant plaster decorations were imported to Halifax from Scotland during the early 19th century, including even more elaborate work for the Legislative Assembly. Although for years scholars have been hopeful that perhaps some of this plaster work could have been ordered from the Brothers Adam, I have not been able to locate any records to prove so. They may have been ordered from someone within the studio of the Brothers Adam, or perhaps from a lesser known maker in Scotland. While he was governor of Nova Scotia, John Wentworth not only had his stone governor's residence in town, he also maintained a country house. This is a watercolor of Wentworth's country house, known as the Prince's Lodge. It was occupied for many years by Prince Edward, the Duke of Kent, a son of George III, who was stationed in Halifax as head of the British Navy in North America. Wentworth offered the Prince full use of the house, and in a way this worked to his great advantage, as the Prince added to it and renovated it to a great extent. Regrettably, the only part of the estate to survive is the ornamental rotunda, seen here in the centre of, of the painting. The rotunda shows up again in the painting scene here. It's visible if you look closely in the center, although it's difficult to see. This painting is in the Royal Collection and was one of the exciting finds of my PhD research. It had previously been identified only as a North American landscape, but based on the rotunda and the surrounding landscape, it is clearly the Bedford Basin and the area around the Prince's Lodge. The Prince evidently enjoyed his time there and commissioned this painting and brought it back to England. And this brings me to the only remaining structure of the Prince's Lodge, the Rotunda, which is still standing and now owned by the city of Halifax. This structure was built as part of the extensive renovations and additions Prince Edward made to the Wentworth property while he lived there. Like the houses built by Wentworth, it is a powerful testament to the ambitions held for Britain's growing colonies in North America. Each of these buildings are, I believe, fascinating and important reminders of the very exciting and ambitious architectural patronage carried out by John Wentworth 
and by his friend and the occupant of his country house, Prince Edward. Looking to this work provides fascinating insight into the standards and tastes of John Wentworth and speaks to his status as an influential patron within both American and Canadian art history. Thank you.